Hi, I'm Pastor Kathy, and I want to share with you a midweek update. First of all, this Sunday evening, June 14th, there will be a concert in our church parking lot. So you can bring your lawn chairs. You could also sit in your car. The concert will begin at 6 p.m., and the group that will be performing is the group titled And Friends. They are familiar to us. They are, uh, will be playing instruments, and we hope that it's nice weather and gives us a chance to be outside and enjoy one another. Then in a couple weeks on June 27th, we will have our next noisy offering in our church parking lot. That will be from 10 to 11, and the kids will be there to greet you and, and receive your offering. The money that we raise from that will go to the baby fold as we have done before. So June 27th from 10 to 11. Lastly, I just wanna let you know or remind you that we continue to have conversations about the reopening of the church. There are many, many steps involved with doing that, and so we promise to stay, keep you informed, and let you know how that process goes. But I do know for now that you can anticipate that worship services will continue to be online throughout the month of June, and then we will keep you posted. It's been, again, a difficult week and difficult season. But as our African-American brothers and sisters have reminded us so clearly, it's been more than a season for them. It's been a lifetime of challenges and struggles. And so we as your pastors, Kent and Kim and I, want to invite and encourage you to be in a season of dialogue and conversation, of listening and learning, so that we can all grow and understand. So in a moment, we'll be sharing with you an interview that Kent did with Zachary, Jasmine, and Harlan Montoya as they share their reactions to the killing of Mr. George Floyd and the protests that have followed. The interview will take about 25 minutes, but this will be a 20, 25 minutes that I believe that you will find um, to be meaningful and helpful. As we continue to grow and dig deeper, as we continue to understand the ways that we have been complicit and that we need to grow in our understanding. So I hope that you will take the time to watch the interview, if not now, at another time. And then I hope to see you in worship this weekend. Be well, take care, and stay connected. God bless. Hi, I'm here with Zachary Jasmine and Harlan Montoya. They've been gracious enough to, to come and do an interview we want to listen to a lot of voices right now. This is a season for us of learning and listening. So we're going to plan on just having some different voices speak to us so we can get more insights into what's going on in our country and who we are called to be as God's people. So I'm very grateful to, to these three, to Zachary and Jasmine and their beautiful daughter Harlan, uh, baby sister is at home, but the three of them are here. And so I'm just going to ask a few questions and we thank you very much for sharing what's on your hearts. How have you personally been affected by the killing of Mr. George Floyd and the, just the media that we've had on that since that happened? Okay. Uh, well, for me, you know, in this time and growing up uh, with social media and that growing presence, it just seems like it's almost deja vu or I've seen it before and you know, I know it's been happening way before me, but now the eyes are on you and it's something that has to be answered for. And I think that if anybody has seen the video or feels any different for how things took place and what ultimately ended up happening, I think that you see someone uh, like a previous video where Eric Garner, where someone was begging for their life begging to breathe and a situation like that should I, I just feel like there's not much argument for it in my eyes and I think as for uh, the way my family viewed it as well my immediate family they feel the same way and it's just it's just a tough thing to think about that that is a perception that may be because of us being black or 
you know, people being black, that they are, you know, um, yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's just uh, something that it feels like we're, we're never innocent, but we're always proven guilty, I, I guess you could say, or, you know, there's always a suspicion that there's something worse with us or, you know, maybe she can elaborate. Um, well, I'm, I just, George Floyd wasn't the first, but he just needs to be the last. So I was extremely upset and, you know, I couldn't even watch the video just to listen to someone scream for their mother as a mother. is just something that I couldn't stomach or I couldn't get through. And uh, I was talking to my grandmother that morning about it and she, my daughter, the, the oldest walked in and she had to ask me like, why did the police do that? And, you know, I don't really, I don't like to lie to her. I don't want to mislead her and give her this false reality. So I had to explain to her so the, the, what, what it was and why the police did what they did. And her, her next question just gutted me. She asked me, were the police going to kill her daddy? So is this, this, that's not a conversation I should have to have with a three-year-old. So um, he, just, he just needs to be the last. It shouldn't, this is not something that should continue on. It's just, we need a, we need a it just needs to change. Would you mind me asking about any kind of racism that you've experienced directly yourselves? Um, I've been called the N-word. I've been followed around stores. I've been told my hair was too ethnic. Um, I experienced that a lot in the Navy, telling me my hair was out of regs. Um, I, I, I'm not able to have an attitude or really just show emotion because I come off as an angry black woman. Or um, I, I've been, I tell my husband's story all the time. I went me, my grandmother and my mother when I was younger went to Louisiana because my grandmother's from there. And they don't have street lights, so it's kind of spooky at night. And we stopped at a gas station and a truck full of young white males kept circling it, calling us the N-word and just kept circling the gas station. So we had to hurry up, you know, and get in the car. We waited till they left, but... Um, before we left, and that that I will never forget that because I was I was terrified. Um, it's just I've you know the follow around the store I get all the time, and the hair the hair comments I get a lot, or the overly emotional. Um, I hear a lot. Um, I took I was in the, in the navy. I had issues as well, uh, the reason I was medically separated. They took three years, and they told me it was all in my head, and it was nothing wrong with me. It was just all mental. I come to find out, I actually had a medical issue when I got out which had they just listened to, my, listened to me, um, it could have been resolved and I would have been able to continue my service, but um, my cries just fell on deaf ears. Um, for me, you know, growing up, uh, I did I have a black father and a white mother, um, but I feel like I've never been uh, perceived as white. It's always been a surprise or, you know, I've heard the question, what are you? Like over a thousand times in my life from the time of going to school and stuff like that, like what are you? And you know, to a kid when everybody else is just can walk in the doors and adjust right away to people that look like them and you know, there's only a handful of people that may look like me or or may just be in the black community or the white community. It's just kind of like it takes you back. And, you know, you tell them that I'm black and I'm white. But mm -hmm. then there's still, it's kind of like a, a distance that the kids put in between you when you're not just like them. So a lot of the times I found myself just finding, uh, you know, like acceptance with the black community and stuff like that. and and with more other black children uh, because it's just too much, you know, kind of to put on, I guess, white children. And, and they don't know, I feel like I, it's just a child that only knows white, I feel like they kind of stick to being around their peers. But I just feel like I've just, throughout my life, kind of been uh, an outsider in that aspect, you know, being in a smaller town, smaller community, uh, majority, but being the minority. 
And then also, you know, I too experienced a lot of things in the Navy where when you're perceived kind of off the bat, you know, as someone who is a minority or once they know you're black, the assumption kind of arises that this person might be lazy or, you know, this person is less educated and, you know, that's, that's not the case. You know, I've worked hard to, you know, always be either top of my class and whatever I did or uh, stand out, but it's, it feels like you have to prove yourself a lot more and, you know, I don't see anything wrong with that, but I also see that that's not equal. Zachary, you grew up in this area. Um, what would you say to someone who felt like that racism wasn't really a problem in Bloomington Normal, that everyone here just gets along and we don't have some of the problems with race that maybe they do in the Deep South or maybe in the big cities? Uh, you know, I, I don't think that it's as blatant or there's as much pride in what you are or in racism, but I believe that, you know, if you were to look back in your own personal history and you were to group yourself with everybody you know, you've kept close to yourself, close to yourself, mm -hmm. and if you see that, you know, there's people that were just like me throughout high school that were black, but you didn't associate yourselves with them, I think there would be a lot of cases here where, you know, this person ended up going to a university across from me and they ended up being a, a lawyer or a doctor just as I, but you know, there was some reason that we just didn't hang out or maybe associate with each other. And I think, I wouldn't necessarily call that racism, but I think that you are separating yourself from somebody and I think that that has a big part to play in it. Subtle yeah, it's like, um, you know, an unknown but known. Is there anyone you think we should be listening to right now that maybe we have not been listening to? I just, I feel like um, at this time, it's, it's all, all years, you know, just listening to a black person's testimony and their experiences, it, it says a lot. It's, and it takes a lot for someone to speak up because it hurts, you know? Um, and just don't let that fall on deaf ears like my wife was saying, um, because we're really opening up at this point in time and sharing our story and showing you that, you know, we thought that we won something with civil rights and everything else like that, but it still exists and it's still prominent. Um, I just, like I said, George Floyd wasn't the first, so I feel like with the Rodney King incident, which was like the first big, you know, televised, that's what, that should have been the start. And because that was years ago, and we haven't made any type of, you know, changes since then, I just, you know, Black Lives Matter has been around since, uh, with Trayvon Martin, so we've been, you know, we've been crying for help, and it just... You know, like I said, like we both said, they've been falling on deaf ears. So just listen, you know, we're not making this, you know, we're not making this up. What has your reaction been to the, to the protests that you've seen, to the different kinds of protests that we've seen since Mr. Floyd's death? Um, I feel they're justified. I feel like, um, I, you know, a lot of people think that the rioting is sometimes extreme. It's been proven that a lot of the riots haven't been started by the protesters, just people you know, seeing an opportunity to, you know, get in and cause some chaos. But with just in this country, it seems like that's the only way that people listen sometimes. You know, you have to go to the extreme to get people to see you. We've, you know, we've tried, pre you know, peaceful protests and those seem to not work. So obviously when people are tired, they're angry and, you know, they're trying to find a way to let it, you know, let, let that anger go. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm for it. Yeah, I agree. I, I see a lot, you know, the news portrays the looting and everything else more than the positives, I would say, definitely. Uh, I don't think that those are entirely the same. I do think that there are a lot of opportunists out there. And I think 
the protesting that we've seen has been great and it's been peaceful and they've come up with a lot of different ways and uh, there's still a lot of people that disagree with it or you know say that there's not a problem uh, but just the level of solidarity we have between white and black communities that support the protests and it making it uh, worldwide and you know it's it's a Black Lives Matter global movement at this point. And uh, the protesting, you know, I'm all for it. Uh, definitely support it. And as long as it's peaceful, I don't think that it should be, you know, looked at as a bad thing or as a disruptive thing. What are you hoping will happen as a result of these protests? Uh, well, with like anything, I would hope that at some point it uh, pressures the higher government into making a change, uh, you know, maybe enforcing higher standards. You know, the issue isn't just in law enforcement, it's across the board. There's, there's plenty of issues that haven't happened with law enforcement, with Ahmaud Avery and everything else, and it's just a hateful hate crime type situation but that needs to be addressed and it needs to be pushed from the high higher up all the way down to the lowest of the low um, governments and I think when that happens and we really feel as if we're being treated equal then we have work to do until then um, I, I, I fully agree with that. I, it's not just police. We need, you know, there's a lot of reforms. I was telling him earlier today that America has the highest mortality rate for women, um, you know, that deliver babies of any modern country and black women die at like twice that. So it's, it's, you know, we just need changes all across the board, whether it be a medical, police, government, everything. You mentioned talking to your children about everything that's going on. What advice or suggestions do you have for parents about how they talk to their kids and maybe what they talk with their kids about in light of the things that have happened? Just teaching your kids that, you know, everyone, you know, teaching what the real meaning of equality is and, you know, treating people how you want to be treated and, you know, um, just teaching love and you know I always tell her we lead with love so um, just teaching people teaching your children that you know we are people you know we're all we're all people we're no no one's a different uh, yeah I, I agree I think the most important thing is you trying to instill something into them that not to see people by color or anything else and you know really and plant that in them that we're all the same. You know, we're all God's children or, or whatever you believe. Uh, as long as you believe that we're the human race, then I feel like there should be no issue with teaching your child at a young age because by the time they get to school, that's when you really start noticing that, yeah, they only group with kids that look like them or, or maybe they're more accepting of other kids. And then by the time they get to middle school, there's even more clicky and group, uh, there's more clicks and more groups. And, you know, by the time you're in high school, it's like you're almost at one side and, and then people on the other side. And, you know, you guys start getting your political views and you can't wait to vote and you get real opinionated on matters. But, you know, you start at a really young age. I think that can all be justified at the end of the day is us being the human race and not seeing color. Uh, what about the concept of white supremacy? I mean, often when we talk about white supremacy, people think about the KKK and kind of the old days of marching and grand wizards. Um, do you think white supremacy and white privilege are concepts that are helpful to talk about today? Um, yeah, I mean, we we see that there's still 
<laughs> active white supremacists and active KKK charters and you know they're in plain sight and their message is still the same uh, then maybe they not maybe they're not riding around on horses as much or burning houses down and stuff like that but it seems like they're still able to live the way that they're living but you know if you look at history any type of organization that maybe a black community brought about or you know original black panthers or people that kind of had a way of empowering themselves and their communities they get dismantled and wall street and stuff like the kkk they're still able to ride around and do what they want or hold their own protests and it's not really as i don't know I, they haven't gone in and destroyed it you know if, if you've gone in and destroyed other uh gangs or you know things put together by the black community at times when the black community was being opposed by uh, segregation or redlining districts and everything like that, and they start policing themselves, why can't they do that to the KKK? It's something that, you know, I've always tried to educate myself in, and I just don't see how that wouldn't be something that's happened already. I, I fully agree, because uh, when he was speaking on dismantling, my first thought was Black Wall Street. They burned it down, you know, just out of jealousy and spite, and that was that was it. There was nothing really done. And then um, I'm not sure if these all these men were white supremacists, but the men that were marching because they didn't want to have to wear a mask or didn't want to be confined in their home with guns, they were met with nothing but love. And they, you know, just let them, they let them do that. But the protesters today, they're being met with, even if they're being peaceful with tear gas and, you know, things that just, it just blows my mind. Why, well, that makes, they, you know, that makes no sense to me. But, um, you know, we see it every day. Like he was talking about social media. A lot of people are starting to expose themselves on social media, making, you know, making comments and things like that. And um, luckily, you know, people on Facebook, you know, might as well work for the FBI because they'll find where they work and they're able to they expose them to their employers. And I do like that a lot of uh, companies are jumping on board in support of the Black Lives Matter movement and, you know, letting them know that they hear us. Um, some people aren't okay with it because they feel like they're just trying to profit off of, but I, you know, I'm all for any type of positive um, reinforcement of, equal, you know, equality. But white, uh, white privilege definitely does exist. I know some people don't recognize it. Um, it's hard to recognize something that you've had your whole life and you've never, it's not something that you can see. But um, just if you know, people start to realize, like, have you ever, do you have to have that talk with your children about how to interact with the police? Or do you have to have the talk with your children on, you know, if they're approached by a group of, you know, a mob of white men, you know, you know that's not something that um, most white people are gonna have or have to talk to their kids about. For people who are not familiar with Black Lives Matter, how would you define Black Lives Matter? Um, I know people always counteract with the all lives matter. We, you know, I recognize that all lives do matter, um, but right now in this country, black lives aren't, don't matter. They don't really matter there. Um, so in order for us to all matter, you have to uplift the ones that need it. We need it right now. So. Is there anything that else that you would like to say right now? No, I just uh, appreciate you guys doing this. Yes. You know, this is definitely a start in our own community that we haven't already been doing. You know, the protests have been great. The organization has been great. The support has been great. Yes. And I think enough small communities like this, enough 1% all the way around can really turn the minority into a majority. So. You know, I appreciate, especially you guys doing this, you're playing a part in, uh, you know, something that will inspire change and, you know, something we'll look back on and all be appreciative of. Jasmine, Harlem, and Zachary, I want to thank you so much for coming in. I really appreciate you talking with us. Um, I know it's not easy to, to talk about some of these things and you all are putting yourselves out there not sure how people are going to respond, um, but I think it's important that we hear your voices. So I'm so appreciative, and I want to commit to, to work with you 
to build a better community and a better world. And thank you, Harlem. Thank you. <laughs> I also want to thank everyone who's taken the time to watch this interview and to listen. Let's continue to listen. Let's continue to be in conversation. God bless you. <laughs>